नमस्ते माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज द सेकंड वीडियो अबाउट भगवान श्री राम नाम हरिज सटल टीचिंग्स व्हिच आर वेरी वेरी यूजफुल फॉर द साधकास हु आर एडवांस्ड इन देयर self inquiry and meditations techniques so this is my second video in the same sequence so now i will describe how maharishi has explained how to go for meditation it is necessary to practice meditation frequently and regularly until the condition induced becomes habitual and permanent throughout the day therefore meditate you lost sight of the bliss because your meditative attitude had not become natural and because of the recurrence of latent tendencies of the mind when you become habitual reflective the enjoyment of spiritual beauty should becomes a matter of natural experience it is not by the single realization of i am not the body that the goal of self is reached do we become royalty by seeing a king once one must constantly enter samadhi absorption in the self and realize one's self and completely blot out the old tendencies and the mind before one becomes the self meditation on the self is our natural state it is only because we find it hard that we imagine it to be an arbitrary and extraordinary state we are all unnatural the mind resting in the self is its natural condition but instead of that our minds are resting on outward objects meditation helps to remove the illusion that the self must be seen how do you see the i now do you hold a mirror in front of yourself to know your own being the answer is the i realize that it is the truth withdrawing all thoughts from sense objects one should remain fixed in steady non objective inquiry see the self my meditation in this manner trace every thought to its origin never allow thought to run on if you do it will be unending take it back to its starting place and the mind will die of inaction go back by the question who am i no meditation on any kind of object is helpful in meditating on an object whether concrete or abstract you are destroying the sense of oneness and creating duality meditate on what you are in a reality obviously the seer is more real true and important than the seen since the seen is dependent on it so turn your attention to the seer and who is the source of your i and realize that up to now you have been studying the object on not the subject now find out what the word i stand for all kinds of thoughts arise in meditation unless they rise up how can they be destroyed they rise up spontaneously in order to be extinguished in due course the self is realized with a mind that is turned inward when the mind sees its own source it becomes that next is who am i and whence am i 
the thought who am i will destroy all other thoughts and finally kill itself also if other thoughts arise without trying to complete them one must inquire to whom did this thought arise what does it matter how many thoughts arise as each thought arises one must be watchful and ask to whom is this thought occurring the answer will be to me if you enquire who am i the mind will return to its source the thought thought which arose will also submerge as you practice like this more and more the power of the mind to remain as its source is increased as for the necessity of watching the breath before enquiring who am i all depends on a man's aptitude and his fitness those who do not have the mental strength to concentrate and direct it on the quest are advised to watch their breath since such watching would as matter of course bring the mind under control who am i will destroy all other thoughts and like the stick used for stirring the burning pyre it will itself be destroyed in the end as long as there are impressions of objects in the mind so long is the inquiry who am i required as long as there are enemies within the fortress they will continue to sally forth but if they are destroyed as the emerge the fortress will fall into our hands as a matter of fact in the quest method which is more correctly whence am i and not merely who am i we are trying to find whence the i thought the ego the mind arise within us the method contains within itself though implicitly the watching of breath when we watch the root of thoughts we are necessarily watching the source of breath also as the i thought and breath arise from the same source to enquire who am i is really trying to find out the source of the i thought you are not to think of other thoughts such as i am not the body etc seeking the source of i thought serves as a means of getting rid of all other thoughts who is born it is only he who ask whence am i born that is truly born in brahma the prime source he indeed is born eternally he is the lord of saints he is the ever new we should not give scope for other thoughts but keep attention fixed on the i thought this is done by asking to whom the thought arises and if the answer is i get rid of the thought by asking the question who is this i and whence its source the meditation or mantra so hum i am that is not the same as who am i they are different why should we go on repeating so hum or affirming i am that one must find the real i within tracing within the source of i we see it the apparent sense of i has no separate existence but merge, merges in the real i who am i is not to be used as a mantra if if means you must find out where in you arises the i thought which is the source of all other thoughts perception memory or any other experience only comes to the i you don't have these experiences during sleep and yet you existed during sleep and you exist now too that shows the i continues while other things come and go who am i means you must concentrate and see where the i thought arises instead of looking outward look inward and see where the i thought arises never mind whether 
there are visions or sounds or anything else or whether there is a void are you present during all this or are you not you must have been there even during the void to be able to say you experience the void to be found in that you the quest for the eye from start to finish whatever other methods may be chosen there will always be the doer that cannot be escaped just who is that doer is what must be found out until then the sadhana practice cannot be ended so eventually all must come to find out who am i you complain that there is nothing preliminary or positive to start with you have the i to start with suggestive replies to the inquiry such as shivoham i am shiva are not to be given to the mind during this meditation the true answer will come by itself any answer with the ego might have cannot be correct any answer with the ego might give cannot be correct these affirmations or auto suggestions may be of help to those who follow other methods but not not in this method of inquiry the inquiry to know the self is different from the method of shivoham or soham i am he i rather lay stress upon self knowledge for you are first concerned with yourself before you proceed to know the world and its lord the soham meditation of i am brahma meditation is more or less a mental thought but the quest i speak of is a direct method and indeed superior to other meditations for the moment you get into a moment of quest for the self and get deeper and deeper the real self is waiting to take you in then whatever is done is done by something else and you have no hand in it you gain you gain steadiness in practice only through more practice next is i i whence does the i arise seek this within the i then vanishes this is the pursuit of wisdom where the i vanishes these there appeared an i i by itself this is the infinite though it reveals itself thus it is not the ego i but the perfect being the self absolute where the i vanished and merged in its source there appears spontaneously and continuously an i i this is the heart the infinite supreme being on driving deep upon the quest who am i and from whence thoughts disappear and consciousness of self then flashes forth as the i i within the cavity of every seeker's heart the i i consciousness is the absolute though it comes before sahaja the permanent and highest level of experiencing the self there is in it as in sahaja itself the subtle intellect the difference being that in the latter the sense of forms disappear which is not the case in the former making the corpse body remain as a corpse and not even uttering the word i one should enquire keenly thus now what is that rises as i then there would shine in the heart a kind of wordless illumination of the form i i that is there would shine of its own accord the pure consciousness which is unlimited and one the limited and many thoughts have disappeared if one remains quiescent without abandoning that experience the egoity the individual sense of the form i am the body will be totally destroyed and at the end of final thoughts the i form also will be quenched like the fire that burns camphor the great sages and scriptures declare that this alone is release 
it is the divine self that shines in the heart as i i when the mind turns inward seeking who am i and merge in the heart then the i hangs down this head in shame and the one i appears as itself rejoice eternally the heart rejoice at the feet of the lord who is the self shining within as i i eternally so that there is no alternation of night and day this will result in removal of ignorance of the self the realization of i is indeed the self which is experienced as i i shining of its own accord the absolute being the witness of the three states of waking dream and the deep sleep distinct from the five states aware of the mental modes in the waking and dream states and of their absence in state of deep sleep problems and their solutions you may experience you may experience anything but you must never rest content with that whether you experience pleasure or pain ask yourself the question who feels the pleasure and carry on the practice sadhana until pleasure and pain are transcended till reality alone remains so long as these thoughts of activity are there sleep will also be there thoughts and sleep are counterparts of the same thing we should not sleep too much or go without it altogether but sleep only moderately to prevent too much sleep we must try and have no thoughts as an aid in overcoming the tendency to sleep or go unconscious during meditation eat only sattvic pure not spicy or highly seasoned food and that too in moderate measure and not indulge in too much physical activity sleep is the first of obstacle the second is the sense objects of the world which divert one's attention the third is the thoughts in the mind about previous experiences with the sense objects the fourth is bliss in in that state the thought i am the enjoyer is still present the final state of samadhi is to be reached in which one is the bliss or one with reality the more you get fixed in the self the more the thoughts will drop of themselves regulation of life such as getting up at a fixed home um, fixed hour bathing doing mantra japa repetition observing ritual all this is for people who do not feel drawn to self inquiry or are not capable of it but for those who can practice this method all rules and disciplines are unnecessary success in turning the mind inward is achieved by practice self inquiry and dispassion and it succeeds only gradually do not regret tamas inertia sluggishness but when sattva purity harmony comes into play hold on to on to it and make the best of it the thought i am not able to concentrate is itself an obstacle why should the thought arise there is consciousness along with the quest quietness in the mind this is exactly the state to be aimed at the word diving is only appropriate if one has to turn the mind within in order to avoid being distracted by the ongoing tendencies of the mind but when deep quietness prevails without obstructing the consciousness where is the need to dive practice next is practice effort is necessary up to the stage of realization even then the self should be spontaneously become evident otherwise happiness will not be complete up to the state of 
spontaneity there must be effort in some form or other divine grace is essential for realization but grace is vouch saved only to him who is a true devotee or a yogi one working to gain union of the mind and self it is given only to those who have striven hard and ceaselessly on the path of freedom there is a state beyond effort and effort effortlessness however until it realized effort is necessary that which is in peace all that we need to do is to keep quiet peace is our real nature we spoil it what is required is that we cease to spoil it grace is always there but practice is also necessary staying in the self by one's efforts with the self inquiry is like training a rogue's bull to remain confined to his stall by tempting him with luscious grass and preventing him from straying it is necessary both for you to strive and for the guru to help the guru the guru's grace is indispensable but so is one's own effort in per- putting into practice the instructions given by the guru effort must efforts must be made in the waking state and alerts consciousness and self realized here and now effortlessness and choiceless awareness is one real nature if we can attain that state and abide in it it is all right but one cannot reach it without effort the effort of deliberate meditation of course every master and every book tell the aspirant to keep quiet but it is not easy to do so that's why all this effort is necessary even if we are if we find somebody who have achieved the supreme state of stillness you may take it that that the necessary effort had already been made in a previous life see what helped you to keep out thoughts and adopt that for meditation your effort is mean to not allow yourself to be distracted by other thoughts than your meditation practices are needed as long as one has not realized they are for putting an end to obstacles to abiding in the self as soon as they come here some want to immediately be self realized being they ignore the effort involved or required is there a shortcut to liberation is it something to be purchased in a shop what is important is steadfast resolve it does not make much difference if you concentrate on the top of the nose the center of the eyebrow or sound of the mantra and so on the really important being is to pay thing is to pay attention to the source or perception or mantra to the eye that hears the mantra or perceives the objects of concentration keep your attention fixed on that perseverance alone counts the more you meditate the easier it becomes to meditate till at last it becomes natural practice is necessary then there is grace your repeated effort is bound to arise tendencies leave god's job leave god's job to god you have to do what is in your hands when the time is ripe god's grace which is always operating will be felt the mistake one is prone to make is to abandon effort under the mistaken impression that god's grace is absent one should not slacken for god's grace is bound to operate in due time when you are ripe next is satsanga 
if one gains association with the sadhus of what use are all the religious observances when the excellent cool southern breeze itself is blowing what is the use of holding a hand fan sacred bathing places that are compound of water composed of water and images and deities which are made of stone and earth cannot be comparable to those great souls oh what a wonder the bathing places and deities best of purity of mind after countless days whereas such purity is instantly bestowed upon people as soon as sadhus see them with their eyes heat will be removed by the cool moon poverty by the celestial wish fulfilling tree and sin by the ganges but know that all these beginning with heat will be removed merely by having darshan sight of incomparable sadhus the supreme state which is praised and which is attained here in this life by clear self inquiry which arises in the heart when association with a sadhu is gained is impossible to attain by listening to preachers by studying and learning the meaning of the scriptures by virtuous deeds or by any other means by such sangha the association with the objects of the world will be removed when that worldly association is removed the attachment or tendencies of the mind will be destroyed those who are devoid of mental attachment will perish in that which is motionless thus the attain liberation cherish their association satsanga really means association with the unmanifest sat or reality but as very few can do that they have to do the second best which is association with the manifest truth sat that is the guru one who knows or has realized the truth is also regarded as a truth such sangha will make the mind sink into the heart such association is both mental and physical the extremely visible beings of the group who sees the mind inward he is also in the heart of the seeker and so he draws the letters inward bent mind into the heart association with the sages should be made because thoughts are so persistent the sage has also the sage has already overcome the mind and remains in peace being in his proximity helps to bring about this condition in other otherwise there is guru the marks of a guru are steady abidance in the self looking at all with an equal eye unshakable courage at all times in all places and circumstances he is proper guru to whom your mind is attuned he should be endowed with tranquility patience forgiveness and other virtues he should be capable of attracting others even with his eyes just as a magnet attracts iron he should have a feeling of equality towards all he who has these virtues is a true guru choose that one where you find you you get peace if you wish to know what is the nature or real form swarupa of a guru you must now know your own nature or real form first how can one know the nature of the guru if one does not know one's own real nature if you want to know the real nature of the guru you may you may must find out to learn to look upon the whole world as the guru's form one must see guru in all living beings the guru is the best tower of silence who reveals the light of self knowledge which shines as the residual reality spoken words are of no use whatsoever if the eyes of the guru meet the eyes of the disciple contact with the guru is necessary it is like the elephant which wakes up on seeing a lion in its dream 
even as an elephant wakes up at the mere sight of the lion, so too it is certain that the disciple wakes up from the deep sleep of ignorance into wakefulness of true knowledge through the Guru's benevolent look of grace. Work within. The Guru is both within and without, so he creates conditions to drive you inwards and prepare the interior to drag you to the center. Thus he gives you a push from outside and exerts a pull from within so that you will be fixed at the center. In sleep you are centered within on waking your mind rushes out simultaneously thinking this, that and the other. This must be checked. It is possible only for the agent who can work both within and without. Can he be identified with a body? Because you think you are a body, you think the Guru also is a body and that he will be something tangible to you. However, his work lies within in the spiritual realm. Oh. He who instructs an ardent seeker to do this or that is not a true guru. The seeker is already afflicted by his activities and wants peace and rest. In other words, he wants cessation of his activities. If a teacher tells him to do something in addition to or in place of his other activities, can that be a help to the seeker? Activity is creation. Activity is the destruction of one's inherent happiness. If activity is advocated, the advisor is not a guru, but a killer. In such circumstances, either the creator Brahma or death Yama may be said to have come in the guise of a master. Such a person cannot liberate the aspirant, he can only strengthen his fetters. <laughs> the Guru is both external and internal. From the exterior he gives a push to the mind to turn it inwards. From the interior he pulls the mind towards the self and helps in guiding the mind. This is Guru's grace. There is no difference between God, Guru and the self. God who is immanent in his grace takes pity on the loving devotee and manifests himself according to the devotee's development. The devotee thinks that he is a man and expects a relationship between two physical bodies. But the Guru who is God incarnate works from within helps the man to see the error of his ways and guides him on the right path until he realizes the self within. The Guru is absolutely necessary. The Upanishads say that no one but a Guru can take a man out of the jungle of mind, intellect and sense perceptions. A realized one sends out waves of spiritual influence which draw many people towards him. Yet he may sit in a cave and maintain complete silence. We may listen to lectures upon truth and come away with hardly any grasp of the object. But to come into contact with a realized one, though he speaks nothing, will give much more grasp of the subject. He never needs to go out among the public. If necessary, he can use other as instruments. The Guru does not bring about self-realization. He simply removes the obstacles to it. The Guru is always within you. If the disciple finds the Guru internally, then it does not matter where he goes, staying here or elsewhere must be understood to be the same and to have the same effect. The Guru will go with the disciple in his own path and then gracefully turn him into the supreme path at the ripe moment. Suppose the car is going at top speed to stop it at once or turn it at once would be attended by disastrous consequences. The Guru, not being a physical form, his 
contact will continue even after his physical form vanishes. If one enlightened sage exists in the world, his influence will be felt or benefit all people and not simply his immediate disciples. Conquering a thousand elephants is nothing beside the Guru's power to conquer the rutting elephant of the ego. It is necessary for you to strive and natural for the Guru's help to annihilate recurrent tendencies and bring to being knowledge free from dread, delusion and desire. Know that the mantra true is but devotion to the Guru's feet. Who meditates on Guru's feet, the flawless flame of pure awareness gains from grace supreme, the gift of pure awareness, clarity of mind and that ends all sorrow. If you are working with your available light, you will meet your Guru as he will be seeking you himself. The Guru is none other than the Self. This is the most important point, most, most, most important point. The human never says that God, the Self, is the Guru appearing as a man to dispel the ignorance of man, just as a tame deer is used as a decoy to capture a wild deer. He has to appear in a body in order to dispel the I am the body notion of the seeker. If the Guru is silent, the seeker's mind gets purified itself. I have not said that a Guru is not necessary, but a Guru need not always be in human form. First a person thinks that he is an inferior and then there is a superior, all-knowing, all-powerful God who controls his own and the world's density destiny. So he worships him or does devotion to him. When he reaches a certain stage and becomes fit for enlightenment, the same Guru whom he was worshipping comes as a Guru and leads him on. That Guru comes only to tell him that God is within yourself. Dive within and realize God, Guru and the Self are the same. <sighs> Ripened by the matchless power of self-awareness, now the Guru stands as a transcendent being supreme. He who penance done, he who penance done, become the target of his glance of grace, gains greatness that surpasses his speech. Next, very important <coughs> term is grace. Grace is there all along. Grace is the self. It is not something to be acquired. All that is necessary is to know its existence. In the same way, the sun is pure brightness. It is ever there and shines and you are surrounded by sunlight. Still, if you want to know the sun, you must turn your eyes in its direction and look at it. Similarly, grace is only to be found by effort, although it is here and now. We cannot attain realization of the self by our mind unaided by God's grace. One's ignorance of the self revealing immediately of divine grace is not proof of its absence. If the world does not see the sun that illumines the whole world, is that the fault of the sun? Is it not due to ignorance of the bird or the defectiveness of its sight? Your very desire for grace is due to the grace that is already working in you. As for grace, it is ever within you. You are never out of its operation. Grace is always there. In full enjoyment of silent bliss, the gift of grace that flows from wisdom's Lord, the Lord of Self, the Jiva's Nirvana is casting off the fivefold sheath attachment to the body. 
Grace is always present. You are neck deep in water and yet cry for water. This passion cannot be acquired nor realization of truth nor inheritance in the self. In the absence of the Guru's grace, but practice is necessary. Grace is in the beginning, middle and the end. God, grace and Guru are all synonymous and also eternal and immanent. The highest form of grace is silence. It is also the highest instruction, Upadesa. Though through divine grace one can go beyond the influences of past actions. Individually we are incapable because our mind is weak. Grace is necessary. Sadhu Seva, serving a holy being, one whose life is totally dedicated to God will bring it about. To me there is no distinction. Grace is flowing like the ocean, ever full. Everyone draws from it according to his capacity. How can one who brings only a tumbler complain that he is not able to take as much as another who has bought a jar? It is only by God's grace that you think of God. Why do you cry that there is no mercy from the Lord that is there to sob about instead of being poised in the self why do you go on wailing what is this talk of guru's grace does the guru hold you by the hand and whisper something in your ear you imagine him to be what you were yourself because you were identified with the body you think that he is also a body and will do something tangible to you but his work lies within how is Guru found? If a devotee prays to God unselfishly, God who is immanent in his grace takes pity on the loving devotee and manifests himself as a being according to the devotee's standard. The devotee thinks that he is a person and expects a relationship between them as a body, but the Guru, who is God or Self incarnate, works from within, helps the person to see the error of his ways and guides him along the right path until he realizes the Self within. After such a realization, he feels, I was so worried before I am after all the self. The same as before, but not affected by anything. Where is he now who was so miserable? He is nowhere to be found. What should we do now? Only live up to the words of the Master. If toward the Lord you take one single step, then with much more than a mother's love, he takes nine steps towards you to accept you. Such is the Guru's grace. Next comes the surrender. There are two ways of achieving surrender. One is looking into the source of the I and merging into that source. The other is feeling I am helpless myself. God alone is all powerful and accept my throwing myself completely on him. There is no other means of safety for me. And thus gradually developing the conviction that God alone exists and the ego does not count. Both methods lead to the same goal. Complete surrender is another name for jnana or liberation. Surrender appears easy because people imagine that once they say with their lips I surrender that they can be free to do whatever they like. But the fact is you can have no likes or dislikes after you surrender. You will your will become completely non-existent with the Lord's will taking its place. Surrender is complete only when you reach the state thou art all and thy will be done, thy will be done. You will know in due course that you, your glory lies where you cease to exist. In order to gain 
that that state you should surrender yourself then the master sees that you are in a fit state of receive guidance he guides you the master is within and without he gives a push from without and exerts a pull from within so that you may be fixed at the center leave it all to the master surrender to him without reserve all this task of surrender is like pinching a jaggery refined brown sugar image of lord ganesha and presenting it as a sweet sweets offering to the same lord you say you offer your body soul and possessions to god where they the yours to begin with that you could offer them you are perfect and complete so abandon the idea of incompleteness there is nothing to be destroyed ahankara as the individual i is not a real thing it is the mind that makes the effort and mind is not real just as it is not necessary to kill a rope that one imagines to be a snake so also there is no need to kill the mind knowing the form of the mind makes the mind disappear that which is forever non existent is already removed if you have surrendered you must be able to abide by the will of god and not make a grievance of what may not please you things may turn out differently from what you wish or what they look apparently what is destiny there is no destiny surrender and all will be well throw the responsibility on god do not bear the burden yourself what can destiny do to you then during worldly activity if your attention is fixed on the fundamental reality there is no difficulty but ordinary people forget the reality and take the same alone to be real the different i eyes are not real there is only one i the separate i is like a watchman in the fort he is like the protector of the body the real owner is everybody is only the one real i so when the separate i surrenders to the real i then i and mine are eliminated the true state comes into existence when after sorting out what belongs to whom the ego i surrenders itself to the real owner and the grace of god is obtained practically by self surrender if you have surrendered but still doubt god's grace where does the fault lie grace is constant your judgment is variable surrender will make one understand his grace you say you have surrendered but still do not feel the grace of god since security is want sincerity is wanting surrender should not be verbal or conditional surrender unreservedly and the higher power will reveal itself the disciple surrender to his master that means there is no wasting of vestiges of individuality retained in the disciple if surrender is complete all sense of individuality is lost there is no cause for misery the eternal being is only happiness and that is revealed you ask if you you ask if you if grace cannot hasten complete competence for the search leave it to god surrender to him unreservedly he never forsake forsakes the one who has surrendered one of two things must be done either surrender because you admit your inability and require the higher power to help you or investigate the cause of misery go into the source and merge in the self either way you will be free from misery 
the ego submits only when it recognizes the higher power such a recognition is surrender or submission otherwise ego remains stuck up like an image carved out on a temple tower making a pretense by its trained look and posture that is supporting the tower on its shoulders shoulders the ego cannot exist without the power but thinks that it acts of its own accord surrender to god and await his pleasure if you ask him to do as you please it is not surrender but demand of it you cannot have him obey obey you and yet think you have surrendered he knows that is the best and when and how to do leave everything entirely to him his is the burden you have no longer any cares all your cares are for him such is surrender surrender can take effect when done with full knowledge such knowledge comes after inquiry it ends in surrender if one has surrendered himself to god or guru the power to which he has surrendered will take him on the right course one need no longer concern himself about the course the doubt will arise only if he fails to obey the master in all details surrender consists in giving up oneself and one's possessions to the lord of mercy then what is left over for the man nothing neither himself nor his possession the body is liable to be born and to die but having made over to the lord mind needs no longer worry about it birth and death cannot strike terror for where is the identity of the individual to be frightened it is true that the divine will prevails at all times and under all circumstances the individuals cannot act on their own accord recognize the force of divine will and keep quiet surrender itself is a mighty prayer if you believe that god will do all the things that you want him to do then surrender yourself to him otherwise let god alone and know yourself whose fault is it if the traveler instead of putting his luggage in the conveyance which bears his load anyway carries it on his head or in his lap to his own inconvenience if a fully responsive if a full responsibility is thrown on the higher power things will go on of their own accord we walk on this ground while doing so do we usually consider each step as to whether we should raise one leg after the other or stop at some stage is not walking done automatically the same is the case of inhaling and exhaling no special effort is made to inhale or exhale the case is the same with life also quite a number of things are done automatically without our being conscious of it if actions of the mind speech and body are merged with god all the burdens of life are on him when one has completely surrendered oneself at the feet of shiva thereby becoming the nature of the self the resulting abundant peace in which there is not the least room within the heart for one to make any complaint alone is the nature of supreme devotion if one surrenders completely there will be no one left to ask questions or to be considered either the thoughts are eliminated by holding on to the root thought i or one surrenders unconditionally to the higher power there are the only two or two ways to realize this in self inquiry dissolve the ego by looking for it and finding it to be non existent whereas devotion surrenders it therefore both comes to the same ego free goal which is all that is required 
True surrender is the melting of the ego in its source, the heart. God is not deceived by out, outward acts. What he sees in the worshipper is how much of the ego remains in full control and how much is on the verge of destruction. It, it is lazy, legitimate to pray as long as you feel that you are different from the higher power. But better still, attain the state of self-surrender and entrust your entire burden to the Lord, who will then take the burden off your back and give you the feeling that you are in Him and are one with Him. If your surrender is total and complete, you need not ask anything. Try to get rid of the thought, I and mine. Don't feel anything is yours. It is all God's. So thank you, my dear friends, for watching and listening this video. Thank you so much. Please like comment and share the video and subscribe my channel thank you thank you namaskar